So it's a very seductive uh, <laughs> offer, really, get Brexit done, and credit to the Conservative campaign. You know, we all want Brexit done. It's going to be an important election. Why? Because it's going to decide if there will be a Brexit for the United Kingdom or not. So on Thursday, Boris Johnson is probably going to win. And if he does so, uh, the UK will leave the EU. And if he doesn't, there will be a prolonged period of uncertainty. We've had three years of nothingness, sort of. And there has been so much uncertainty and foul play and nothing has happened. And if Labour wins this time, we're going to have an extended period of this uncertainty. There will be another referendum. There will possibly be a referendum over Scotland as well. And I think most of the country doesn't want that to happen. And that's why uh, Conservatives and Boris Johnson is now winning, not because they are tremendously popular in a way, but because people want to have Brexit done. We're living in a society where wealth and inequality is just getting wider and wider. The challenge for people like me, who's in the Brexit party, is that we don't think that the Conservatives can be trusted to deliver a proper Brexit. Who knows what's going to happen? This is the most extraordinary election um, that you've ever seen. December elections are unusual. I, I believe it, it's been close to 100 years or something since there was an election in December in this country. I would be concerned that the weather might affect it, especially in the north and especially for older voters. Hi, I'm Emma Stockdale. I'm standing in the constituency of West Ham for the Brexit party. And I was interviewed and um, was delighted to be given the opportunity. The reason I put myself forward is because I feel really strongly that democracy has to be upheld. We did vote to leave and I was part of the referendum campaign. I campaigned strongly to leave and this has to be respected. The vote has to be respected. So first and foremost, that was why I put myself forward. Um, <laughs> this is a very strong um, Labour constituency. Um, since it actually was created in um, 1997, it's always been Labour. Since 2005, it's been held by the same person, Lynn Brown. It's always been Labour. It's difficult to see because there aren't many polls about West Ham or, or individual constituencies, but the only thing I've seen is the new and recorder. And I started off at 18%, with Labour actually being quite a bit lower, at 14%. Um, and it looked like there might be some hope, but a, a few days later I dropped down to 14% and um, it's now sort of neck and neck with Lib Dems and Labour, which is really unusual in itself. So I don't, I don't expect to win, um, but I think I'll make a really big dent in the Labour vote, to be honest. The reason that can really change is actually West Ham is very, very working class and a lot of people don't realise that 48% of people in West Ham actually did vote to leave the EU. So it's sort of flipped of what was a national sort of figure. But a lot of working class people do feel quite disenfranchised and, and really quite insulted that the government and the powers that be are telling them you didn't know what you voted for. What we want to do as a Brexit party is have a few Brexit party MPs on the green seats so we can actually hold Boris accountable um, and make sure that, or attempt to make sure that he's not going to try and wangle through some pathetic um, agreement that ties us in with the EU forevermore. I mean, I mean, some people are really saying that truthfully, this withdrawal agreement is almost worse than staying in. We need to get out, we need to get out now, and we need to get out cleanly. The EU isn't actually going to last much longer, and they know that, and that's why they're clawing onto us for dear life, because we are the straw that when you pull it out, it's all gonna fall down. 
and they know it and the cash cow is no longer. Sorry, I felt a bit angry there. <laughs> I, really, I really can't believe that I, I, we, we're agreeing to any of the stuff that, that Boris has. We, we don't need to be paying any money, we just need to get out. So, so who knows, one or two might get through. They're predicting that none of us will actually get a seat. I have a strong feeling that Tom Berwick in Dagenham and Rainham may have a really good chance. Here in the campaign office, uh, the East London campaign office for the Brexit party, uh, and I'm part of the team here fighting to get Tom Buick elected uh, for the Brexit party. Um, we're in Dagenham and Raynham constituency, uh, which comprises of nine separate sort of wards is what we call them. Um, so here in the south, we have, uh, in terms of local government, it's more of a conservative run or conservative elected councillors. Whereas in the, the, the midsection and the north of the constituency, it's very much more uh, labour dominated um, local representatives and they, they run the local services for this area. So they're not in Westminster, they're elected representatives, uh, total separate election. We have our elections every sort of uh, four years, council elections, and we had the London ones last year. So all the councillors for the entire ward were elected last year. But obviously this election is about Westminster and the MP, who at the moment the MP is John Cruddis and he's a Labour MP. Um, so we're obviously um, fighting against him in this election. The situation we're in right now is the result of three years of failure really of our political class in the United Kingdom that has failed to deliver on the biggest democratic mandate in British history. More people voted to leave the European Union than have ever voted for any political party in British history. But we've unfortunately had a political class that didn't want Brexit to happen. They campaigned for Remain. So 75% of members of parliament had voted to Remain. Only 25% voted to leave. Now, Although they said they would honour the result of the referendum and that they would deliver on the will of the people, the moment the referendum was over and Theresa May formed her government and she triggered Article 50 and we started the process of withdrawal from the European Union, the Remainers in Parliament, those 75%, began to play all sorts of procedural games with the parliamentary process in order to thwart Brexit, in order to try and overturn the results. Um, many of the parties are trying to pretend that Brexit is, will not, doesn't, doesn't happen, it doesn't exist and they want to talk about everything else but and so now the Labour Party is now effectively a Remain party uh, and as uh, the Tory party are the only party in Parliament that are presenting uh, Brexit as a reality and it should happen. Uh, which, is, which is creating a very difficult situation for Democrats and people that believe that Britain should be an independent country. And so we, what we will see tomorrow is very strange voting patterns. Well, today I think we're looking at a, a result that no one really feels confident that they know what's going to happen. And normally you do know a little bit more. This is not an ordinary general election. This is very extraordinary because there are a lot of people who are voting in a different way than they would normally vote uh, if they particularly want to leave the European Union. Many of them have decided that the only way to do that is going to be to vote Conservative, to get a, a majority Conservative government. But then others who want to stop the European Union are uh, trying to work out which candidate would be most likely to do that. So that's where the Liberal Democrats who are standing very much on a stop Brexit manifesto will probably do well in Remain areas. It's very, very hard to predict. Um, I, what I can say is people are very disillusioned. It's not been a positive election at all. Uh, people are cynical about the main political parties. Um, and if you rely on the, on the polls, it tends to indicate the Conservative Party will win by a majority. The question is, how much of a majority? There will be a Tory majority, um, which is, um, for trade unionists, it's, it's, it on, on the one hand, it's a tragedy. But on the, on, the, on the other hand, many working people want to see Brexit done. Get Brexit done. 
and we can restore confidence and certainty to business and to families. Get Brexit done and we'll see a pent up tidal wave of investment into this country. Get Brexit done and we can focus our hearts and our minds on the priorities. If the Conservative government succeeds and gets a majority, which they're expected to do, then there's a very good chance that we will see Boris Johnson's, he's the Prime Minister, his withdrawal agreement concluded, and we will see the UK leave the EU uh, at the end of January 2020, and that will be followed by a transition period that will go until the end of 2020, during which the UK will effectively remain inside the EU, but technically not, not be part of it. And then hopefully during that period, we'll see the conclusion of the future arrangements between the, the UK and the EU in the form of a free trade agreement. Now, I would expect that it will take longer than the 10 months or so to do that. In fact, it could take two years. So what I think you're probably going to see is some kind of another subsequent interim agreement put in place that will have phase-in periods that will allow for that time frame. So I don't think there'll be any circumstance under which there will completely be a breakdown of trading relations between the UK and the EU. Now, if Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party does not get their majority, what you will probably see is a coalition government being formed by the opposition Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, in conjunction with the Scottish National Party, the Scottish Independence Party, and together they would form a coalition which would probably put in place a second referendum on UK membership in the EU. Now we don't know what the terms of that referendum would be, but there probably would be at least two if not three options one of which would be to remain in the EU entirely. Now, that second arrangement will also depend likely on there being a second Scottish referendum in terms of its independence from the United Kingdom. And the outcome of that, we also don't know. Many working class areas in the north of England, in places like Wales, uh, in uh, London where I'm standing, in East London, in Dagenham and Raynham, where 70% of people voted to leave. These are post-industrial heartland cities where on the whole voters will not put their trust in the Conservative Party they are attracted to the Brexit Party. I'm from the uh, left of British politics I used to be in the Labour Party for 27 years um, but I left that party because I could see it was going to sell out five million Labour voters that wanted to leave the European Union. Now back in the summer when we were potentially standing in all 650 seats our party leader Nigel Farage made uh, an informal offer to Boris Johnson that said, look, we will stand down in those seats where the Conservatives have the best chance of winning, um, but you will need to stand down in those seats where the Conservatives haven't won in a hundred years, but the Brexit Party, because we attract many working class voters to our uh, cause, is the best placed party to then displace the old Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Now the Tories, I'm afraid, have reverted to type. They are a political party that's very old, that believes it has a kind of entitlement to power uh, in this country and almost a sort of born to rule mentality. So it's not reciprocated and it didn't stand down in those seats uh, where, frankly, the Brexit Party is better placed. So. We feel like we've done our service to the country. We put country before party and we'll at least ensure that those Conservatives who are Brexiteers will be returned back to the House of Commons. Hittills är det nästan bara de stora företagen och näringslivsorganisationerna som har fått höras. Och de har ju varit väldigt mycket för att stanna kvar i EU. Men nu när vi ser att det börjar bli, vi börjar gå mot att det blir allt svårare att förhindra en brexit så har de istället för att eh, så har de börjat ompositionera sig och för att kunna behålla marknadsandelar framöver så måste de säga att vi har läget under kontroll. Så om man tittar på City här borta så är ju många av de stora bankerna som tidigare var de som var mest negativa till brexit. De har börjat prata om att det kommer kanske inte bli så stora konsekvenser i alla fall. Så där har vi sett, där har vi sett en glidning det sista halvåret. Att man är, man är mer eh, reserverad nu. Man, man, istället för, för, från att ha varit otroligt eh, fientlig till en brexit så är man nu mer, lite, lite mer neutral. Det är något som inte add up about the people who at the time of the referendum, Project Fear we call it, 
were saying all these terrible things were going to happen to the British economy. By the way, these are the same people, the same lobby groups, the same business groups, and the same politicians that were saying that if Britain didn't join the Euro, uh, our economy would also collapse if we didn't join the Euro. Well, we all know what happened to the Euro. Sweden's not part of the Euro. Denmark's not part of the Euro. The United Kingdom, thank God, is not part of the Euro. Prior to the referendum in June of 2016, a number of leading organizations, including the Bank of England, the IMF, the Institute of Directors, the Confederation for British Industry, and I could name others, issued predictions such as uh, departure, loss of employment in the, in the city, in the financial sector, in the tens of thousands, if not 100,000 or more, recession and so on. None of this has happened. And I think the, the, the British, the, the London-based financial sector is incredibly resilient and there's significant synergies that, that exist in London that can't be readily replicated in Frankfurt. For example, access to capital is, is one, the English language, the time zone, the expertise, the talent. And I, I think, I don't think Brexit would, would damage the, the financial sector in the UK un, uh, unretrievably. Um, there's been a lot of focus on misleading information um, and it's more about one party attacking the other so the question people in mind is like who can I trust at the moment nobody who is competent again the feedback is nobody so where does the normal voter go to and they're in a difficult position so it's not an inspiring election at all If you can remember your number when you come up, give it to us. We know they'll give it to you. Um, and that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Labour, but I'm just happy as long as it's anything but Conservative. That's fingers crossed. Oh, thank you very much indeed, sir. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks. All my life I voted Labour because my, we were a Labour family. And um, I've, what I think about it is things are so bad for the majority of the people in this country, uh, the poorer people, the people who haven't got so much, that um, I'm in favour of altering things and hoping that, they, um, that things are much better for them, for the whole, for the, for the many, not the few. Within the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party is very uh, pro-EU. It, they're mostly, they grew up in the Blairite years of Tony Blair that promoted the EU over everything else. And, and so they're putting pressure on the Labour Party to change its position and to abandon Brexit through a very complica complicated policy of claiming to 
win the election, negotiate a new deal, and then come back and campaign against that deal. Now, for most voters, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn is saying it's for the unity of the party. But what, it's, what it really is, is acquiescing to the right wing of the Labour Party um, that want to that effectively merge with the Liberal Democrats. And so in large parts of the country, it will, it will mean a decline in the Labour vote at the expense of the, uh, the interests of the Parliamentary Labour Party, which is very, very damaging, uh, not only for the Labour Party, but for democracy in general. Well, the Labour manifesto is very similar to the last one in 2017. It's a very radical manifesto uh, and it is, you know, uh, ticking a lot of the left wing boxes in terms of uh, getting rid of austerity, particularly putting more money into public services and the health service. Um, but being very um, odd and rather um, silly really about Brexit because the leadership of the party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, is a lever, but he hasn't been able to carry that policy through. But they don't want to come out and say that they are a, a Remain party, so they've got a kind of po uh, refer a manifesto that trying to appeal to everyone. When Corbyn was elected, it was, a, it was seen as a defeat for Tony, the Tony Blair years of war and austerity and privatisation. And so many people that are, were formerly in the Labour Party actually rejoined to make it one of the biggest parties in Europe. And that was the opportunity. At that point, the, the Parliamentary Labour Party tried to remove Jeremy Corbyn in a coup, and that failed. And for us, that was the moment when he should have uh, uh, use that to his advantage and promote a more pro-working class position, but that never happened. Uh, and so we have a situation where they are now effectively a part of the Remain uh, coalition um, on the ground. Labour is on the side of the many, not the few. Thank you very much. Secretly, Jeremy Corbyn would like us to be out because it is going to give that freedom then to start back, not just to get some of the manifesto commitments through in the future, but also because we get back to sort of normal politics, which we haven't had here in the last three years. If we do leave, then that hurdle's removed and we can move ahead with renationalisation of um, our energy markets and the railways. And so, that, so that's why for us, Brexit is so important because it's the start of a, of, of, of a new chapter. In a, in, a, in a struggle for democracy? Be non Brexit for me? I don't know. I hope it's not a Tory victory. I think the Conservatives will deliver. Um, I'm a Remainer. I'm a Remainer, but I think that we have to respect that there are people that don't necessarily share the belief that I do. But for me, it's definitely, um, you know, the, the public services. I, I work in public services, so it, it's a big reason for me. The pressure that they are under is, is unbelievable. And I, I'm, I'm very opposed to the potential selling off of the NHS. No, it's, it's good to have an election, is it? And it's good to come out of the Brexit. People voted to come out of Brexit. We need to come out. And that's it. Pro oh, Labour. Social democracy. All right. <laughs> well, well, all morning we've been, we still don't know how we're going to vote until we actually get into the, the booth, I think. There are too many negative things with each party for me to really be clear. It just feels like I'm dicing with... It has been a very negative ...with an campaign. awful, yeah, yeah, decision, and it's been really bullying. Right. They tell you how to vote in their leaflets, but they don't convince you why you should. So it's just a whole lot of bullying, and the whole thing, like you say, has been completely negative. And that's how it feels, trying to choose the least worst option. First of all, this is my first vote of my 60s, and... Uh, I went to the last, um, the, uh, the referendum for Brexit, Brexit and uh, I voted to stay in, stay, no I didn't, I voted to, uh, I voted for Brexit so, and now I'm European, <laughs> oh, I'm European, I'm through and through, this is, this is Europe, we're part of Europe, and I'm out of here, um, you know, out of Brexit. Um. Yeah.
I think this whole saga shows that Article 50, which after all is the process of any member state leaving the European Union, that the bureaucracy in Brussels is never going to make it easy for a member state to uh, leave the European Union. And we've seen that. Britain is the first country to vote to leave. It's the first country to trigger Article 50 under the um, uh, Lisbon Treaty. And from day one, the European Union's strategy, I think, has been very clear. It's been twofold. The first part of their strategy has been to, frankly, uh, weaken the resolve of a British political class that, A, has had to come to terms with the fact that its own people voted against it in the referendum. Then we carried on having an argument between ourselves about leave or remain. You see that in our British Parliament. And I don't blame Brussels for this. They have exploited the divisions in our country to essentially offer the United Kingdom not the freedom and independence that we voted for, but has said to us, OK, if you want to carry on having market access and a trading relationship with the European Union, you're going to have to sign up to a permanent customs union, so we'll control your trade policy. You're going to have to sign up to single market alignment rules and regulations on labour standards and on the environment. So Brussels' strategy is essentially to keep the UK within the regulatory and legal orbit of uh, the European Union. I don't blame them for that. They still want to see our money. Norway, which isn't a member of the European Union, signs up to all the single market rules. Uh, it's outside the customs union, but still it has to be mindful of ensuring that goods can flow freely, for example, between the Norwegian and Swedish borders. But the point is it pays billions of krona and it has to obey all the rules that it has no say over. So that is the Brussels strategy, but we haven't had in this country, because we've been arguing amongst ourselves since the referendum in 2016, in my view, we haven't had a, a, a patriotic cross-party political class that has A, accepted the result of the referendum, genuinely respected and honoured the result. As I say, more people voted for this than have ever voted for anything else in history, including millions of ordinary working people. Um, and it hasn't united to get the best possible uh, divorce deal with the European Union. We have a, a different situation. We're paying a very high membership to be part of this European Union club, yet we've got a huge trade deficit and we only get 38p back of every pound that we contribute to it. So this must be understood. <laughs> Actually, the European Union is a neoliberal um, authoritarian, uh, anti-democratic bloc that will always stop any sort of socially progressive policies um, that any the government has tried to in introduce. You look at Syriza in Greece, they, 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 they promised um, uh, a more progressive um, policies and because they were bound up with the EU bailout programmes, they actually implemented more austerity and more privatisation in order to stay within the boundaries of EU rule uh, d d demanded by the European Central Bank and the European Commission. essentially a banker's Europe, a Europe on the side of multinationals, which exploits the relative economic disparities between EU member states as a means of keeping a check on the living standards of ordinary workers across the EU, whether they're in Greece, whether they're in Spain, whether they're uh, in Denmark. And people like me, you know, who come from the left of British politics, 
I'm against labour market discrimination. I'm against labour market exploitation. That's why you come into the labour movement, right? Which is why it shocks me and it surprises me that the mainstream Labour Party here in the United Kingdom supports a banker's Europe. It supports that exploitative system. Whereas actually the logic of the European Union, and look, I'm not a Euro Federalist, but I do accept that the logic of, of the European Union, if you're going to make it fairer for all your citizens, is you have to more deeply integrate on your, with the Euro for example, you have to have not just common monetary policy, you have to have probably a common fiscal policy as well. And if you want solidarity between the different parts of your uh, common economic zone, then Germany is going to have to entertain the idea of huge fiscal transfers uh, to Greece and Spain and other parts of the European Union which are less well off. That's what Sweden does in its country with its fiscal transfers between individuals and parts of the country that are less well off than other parts. So the whole logic of the EU, and this is why we're at a critical turning point in the future of the European Union, it has to decide either to fully integrate and federalise or it needs to row back on its current level of integration and start to give member states more power and control over the things that really matter to them. Otherwise, what happens is, and this is what happened with Brexit, Britain sees the, the long-term destiny of the European Union and has looked at a federal European Union and said, sorry guys, you know, we love you dearly, we want to be friends and partners, we want to trade with you as our European friends and partners, but we don't want to be part of the United States of Europe. That's the big argument here. <laughs> The trouble is, in your country, in Sweden and here in Britain and probably elsewhere in the EU, our political classes, the people we look to for the leadership on these issues, ha have never been honest with us about this and they continue to lie to us about the extent to which this is an incrementalist project that is about a one-way ticket to Euro-federalism. leaders voted earlier today so as Big Ben reaches 10 o'clock we are standing by with those crucial exit poll figures here they are the power of surprise the power of victory well, we did it we did it we pulled it off didn't we the power of a Prime Minister with authority firmly in his hands. And with this mandate and this majority, we will at last be able to do what? We paid attention. In winning this election, we have won votes and the trust of people who have never voted Conservative before. Those people want change. We cannot, must not, must not let them down. And in delivering change, we must change too. The country has now voted for a Brexit deal that you hate. Yeah, I think if you said to people, was in the deal, they'd be mortified. There are quite a lot of people here today. We all know that green issues have been way up the agenda compared to previous years. We've seen the cover of Time magazine with Greta Thornburg on it. And yet, even in that, uh, you couldn't make any kind of breakthrough, it seems. Well, I mean, it's down to the voting system. You know, we're going to have... That doesn't help, I understand. It looks like we're going to have a big majority on, you know, less uh, than 50% of the vote for the Conservatives. What are they coming in? About 42%. But, and they're going to have, you know, a mandate really to drive through whatever they want. And that's, 
uh, bad for democracy. But we need to, you know, I think we've learned from this election, we need electoral reform, we need it definitely. Yeah. I just think a lot of people will find it not credible for you to blame it all on Brexit. Not this scale of a defeat. I could see if it was a, sh a smaller defeat or even a hung parliament. But, you know, we've covered the NHS and everything you've had to say about it, tax and spend, all these issues, not just Brexit. It's not credible to claim it's all down to Brexit. Well, there's greatest respect, I think, on those other issues, ending austerity, to making sure that the NHS was protected for the long-term future, on all of those issues. I think we did win the argument, but it's quite clear that people thought there were other priorities, and this Brexit frustration, I think, has broken through. John Minow, thank you for being with us. Labour has lost yeah. touch with its working class, uh -huh. decent supporters in areas of the country who voted by a huge majority to leave. And I think the difference between 2017 and now, as just being mentioned, is actually because then both parties were committed to leaving and honouring the referendum. That changed with Labour, and once that changed, that there's all the other issues too, which I'm sure we'll discuss over the evening in terms of Jeremy Corbyn's position, but Brexit has really changed things up there. And the Brexit party has taken votes from Labour um, too. So, you know, it's it's a very, very damaging night for Labour. A huge, huge if, if, I have to keep saying if, because until I actually see some of these results, it's very difficult to really, really believe them, although I do feel that uh, what is happening in the, our Labour heartlands is going to change and have to have that huge, huge debate within the Labour Party. Otherwise, we're finished. <laughs>
will, will be helped by us getting out, even if it's a Conservative government takes us out. national flags but we're going to wave you goodbye and we'll look forward in the future to working with you as sovereign if you disobey the rules you get cut off